Okay. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, I just wanted to give a quick reminder before I pass over the session to Cyprian and James. Um, this afternoon, well, Central European time this afternoon at 1635 to 1700, 435 to five, um, exhibitors are gonna be giving company pitch presentations. So I just wanted to encourage everyone to visit the exhibitor booth. There's various um, presentations um, and features. So stop by the exhibitor booths and check in. All right, have a great session, guys. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Cyprien Soulen. I'm an associate scientist at CNRS, working at the Earth Sciences Institute of Orléans, and I will be chairing this session. So now it's my great pleasure to, to introduce you, uh, to introduce uh, James uh, McClure. Who will, uh, we, who will be our speaker today. So James is somewhere in the middle of the mountain, as you can see, and uh, mm -hmm. it's quite nice. So James is an associate, uh, is a computational scientist at Virginia Tech. He did his PhD in environmental sciences and engineering. He got a PhD from the University of North Carolina, and his research focused on the development of theoretical and numerical methods to study uh, transport phenomena in porous media, in particular using uh, digital rock physics. So he's a strong advocate of Lattice Boltzmann method, and he uses uh, some of the largest uh, world, uh, some of the largest supercomputer in the world. And he will uh, explain us the the kind of research he's doing. So James, when you want to start, it's up to you. Thank you. So uh, I'm, I'm James McClure, as, uh, as mentioned, and um, today I'm going to be talking about topology and its effect on fluid flow and porous media in particular. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for all of their efforts in getting this all to work remotely. It's a lot of work to do this, and uh, no one, obviously everyone's been surprised by the way 2020 has played out. So I really appreciate their efforts in making things happen. So um, I've made a deliberate effort in my talk today to focus primarily on geometry. Um, I'm not going to talk about other aspects of the physics, you know, as a way to sort of focus on the geometric ideas, um, you know, as, that, that play a role in fluid physics. So uh, there's two main things that I'm going to discuss. First, I'm going to give a quick introduction of where geometry fits into the traditional description of flows and force media. And then I'm gonna talk a bit about geometric characterization, which essentially um, corresponds to how do we construct a set of, uh, of measures that tell us, you know, is the essential information about a structure in an averaged sense. And then the second piece is geometric evolution, which uh, corresponds to how structures change with time. And there's two different perspectives that, that are useful for considering geometric evolution. The first is the perspective of differential geometry, and the second is the perspective of set theory. So I'll talk a little bit about why each of these are important and useful, and also about what the limitations are. So in traditional constitutive mo models for flow and porous media, um, most of the geometric effects are accounted for based on the volume fraction, either of the pore space or of the fluids. So in the first example, if we consider the kozeny karman equation, which predicts the permeability of a material based on the porosity and the length scale, uh, you, you have the porosity coming in, which is essentially a measure of the volume. Uh, and, and then the second example, if we consider the leverett j function, which is used to predict the capillary pressure um, in porous media, Again, you have these same quantities appearing, meaning the permeability, the porosity. And we also introduced the contact angle and the capillary pressure function, which is a function of saturation. So in this expression, the variations in the behavior are predicted based on the saturation, which is again a measure of the volume fraction for the fluids. So in traditional models, there's already geometric information that's embedded in them. Um, but it tends to be uh, things that are easy to measure in an experiment. So at the time when these constitutive models were being developed, there wasn't, you know, experimental imaging technologies that would allow you to directly observe the pore scale distribution of fluids and, and measure all sorts of things based on that. So what that means for today is that because we have access to these technologies, uh, 
we can measure things that couldn't be measured before and use these to build better models. So that's uh, sort of the opportunity that we, we can leverage um, by studying geometry in particular. Because if you think about a microtomography image or something like that, what it's really giving you is geometric information about the, the structure of the fluid and solid uh, materials that are, that are present in a particular sample. So um, where uh, the geometric piece becomes, you know, I think obviously important is when you consider hysteresis for two fluid flow and porous media. So in the left plot, I show a capillary pressure curve and uh, you know, as, as you'll be familiar with probably, uh, you'll get a different trajectory on drainage as you will on imbibition. So depending on the direction the fluid's flowing, uh, you get a different curve. And what this means is that the capillary pressure is not a function of saturation as, as in the leverage J function. Um, instead, it's you know, not a function. And the same thing is true for the relative permeability um, and uh, this is something that's attracted a lot of attention over the years. And in, uh, I think it was in 1993, um, uh, Majid Hazanazada and Bill Gray published a paper where they um, postulated uh, or hypothesized that this hysteresis is due to an incomplete characterization of the, of the geometric state of the system. Essentially that there were additional variables and if you included those, into those additional variables, then you could get a unique relationship. And so they proposed that the capillary pressure should also consider the, the interfacial area between fluids. So a natural question to ask based on that is whether or not interfacial area is enough. Um, in any case, this uh, hypothesis has guided you know, 25 or 30 years of research at this point, including my own. So it's something that's been you know, a very influential idea. And that's where some of these geometric ideas originate in terms of modeling multiphase flow. So, the results that I'm going to present today are uh, really come out of integral geometry in terms of the measures that are used. So integral geometry is essentially a way to determine averaged measures for geometric structures um, for which you can establish that they are in some sense unique. So there's a, a number of people that have, you know, mathematicians that have published results over, you know, the last hundred years, including uh, um, Hadwiger and, uh, and Federer in particular in the uh, 50s, uh, and they showed that the unique scalar invariant measures of a structure are the volume, the surface area, the integral of the mean curvature, and the Euler characteristic or total curvature. So um, we proceed in sort of this geometric question based on this set of measures. To understand what these mean, um, we can start by considering a, just a two-dimensional disk. So in this case, there's only three invariant measures because a two-dimensional you know, two-dimensional structure has one fewer measure than a three-dimensional structure. So the first is the area of the disk, uh, which you can just compute from uh, analytical, you know, analytical results, and you can see that the units is, are are length to the uh, length squared. The second invariant is the perimeter length, which has units of length. And then the third invariant is the total curvature, which is the integral of the curvature of the, of the boundary. And that has units of length to the power zero. If we now go and consider a three-dimensional structure, so just doing the same thing for a sphere, we get another invariant. And we get another invariant because for a two-dimensional structure, there's only one curvature invariant, whereas for a three-dimensional structure, you have two curvature invariants. So you have both the mean curvature and the Gaussian curvature at, at a microscopic point on, on the surface. And when you integrate those, you get two invariants in the average sense as well. So if we compare this to the 2D result, the volume is a direct analog to the area of the disk in the two-dimensional example. The surface area is a direct analog of the perimeter length and the total curvature has the same interpretation in both. It's the total curvature of the boundary. This means that the new quantity that you get in a three-dimensional system is the integral of the mean curvature. So you basically have a second curvature invariant. And you can see that the, the, uh, the units, you know, the volume's length cubed, the surface area is length squared, uh, the total curvature is still length to the power of zero, and then the, the, the length uh, measure is the integral of mean curvature. So 
total curvature is particularly interesting because of the link between total curvature and the topology of a structure, which provides a way to measure how it is how a structure is connected. So you can uh, derive a result known as the Gauss-Binet theorem that links the total curvature of the boundary, uh, including source terms if the boundary is not smooth, uh, to the Euler characteristic, which is in turn uh, linked to other topological invariants known as the Betty numbers. The Betty numbers are, are, are the number of connected components in the system, the number of loops formed within the system, and the number of cavities enclosed within the structure. So what this means is that the zero dimensional measure of size is a topological invariant. This presents some challenges because any topological change is a fundamentally discrete event and dealing with discrete events is, is a little bit uh, different from dealing with continuous events. So um, based on these measures, there's another result known as the Minkowski-Steiner formula, which is actually a, a kinematic evolution equation that's derived using set theory. And what this uh, formula does is it predicts the change in volume for a set based on the um, invariant boundary measures. So the change in volume can be expressed in terms of uh, you know, the, this, uh, this parameter delta, which is the diameter of a sufficiently small ball that we sort of roll around the boundary. So if we roll this ball around the boundary of the red object, then we get the blue region. And what the Minkowski-Steiner formula doing is it's predicting the volume associated with that blue region based on the boundary invariance. So, Based on this, for a particular structure, you should get some set of coefficients. Um, and that is specific to the structure. It's a local result. Because if you choose a ball that is too large, uh, clearly one thing that'll happen is that the blue region will start to overlap with itself. For example, those, those holes in the middle of the red structure can close up if the ball is too big. And if that happens, then the equation will fail and you'll end up with you know, some, uh, some different relationship than, than what you get by the uh, Minkowski-Steiner form. So this is an inherently local expression, and it's a specific statement about a particular object that's restricted to parallel sets. It does tell us two key pieces of information. First, that of the four invariants, there are three independent variables. And it also pro 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 provides a constraint on how to scale geometric information. So uh, essentially, we should scale the whole formula in a consistent way. Based on the Buckingham pi theorem, since we only have units of length in our problem, we can get rid of that unit and reduce the number of independent degrees of freedom. So in the, in the approach that, that we uh, uh, describe in the paper that's linked on this slide, we define the, uh, a normalized delta where you normalize it based on the average radius of curvature for the structures. So if you, dry, if you divide the integral of mean curvature by the surface area, then you get an average radius of curvature. So we substitute this, uh, we, this change of variables into the Minkowski-Steiner formula, and we essentially get a non-dimensional form where there are three uh, invariant measures instead of, instead of four. And these are the volume fraction, uh, which is phi, W, which is a, you know, a weighted mean curvature that's weighted by the, the surface area, and Xi, which is a weighted uh, total curvature, a weighted Euler characteristic. So based on the non-dimensional theory, we're assuming that there's a global form that holds. Basically, uh, because there's a relationship between these measures, that there is some function that relates them all that would be a global function, meaning it would hold for any structure. This is not you know, directly implied by the Minkowski-Steiner formula. It's essentially something that you're assuming and you have to test. So if we want to test this function, we need to be able to generate a lot of information about different structures. We need to you know, essentially generate structures and compare them. So for the, the uh, results in this paper, uh, we use the LBPM software package, which I've developed for a number of years, which is um, available through the Open Forest Media Project um, through the links on the slide. So if you're interested in modeling two fluid flow and four scale systems, uh, this is a pretty mature framework that has uh, workflows for two fluid flow, uh, 
Um, it's scaled to over 10,000 GPU on uh, United States Department of Energy supercomputers. And uh, it actually has an internal analysis framework uh, that will compute the geometric invariance, including uh, subdividing the phases into you know, the, the connected pathway and, and the disconnected regions. So we use this to sort of generate the data. So these are uh, plots of the geometric invariance as well as the fluid pressure difference that were generated in uh, 10 different digital rock images with porosities that ranged from 10% to 38%. And if you look at each of the plots, there's a drainage curve in the solid line and an imbibition curve in the dashed line. So you can see that there's hysteresis for each of the geometric invariants for all of the variables. And you can see they sort of, you know, the scatter plots sort of cover a lot of that space. So what we're looking to do in terms of establishing a global form is to see if we can collapse all of this data onto a single surface that has two degrees of freedom. Now, if we want to get to this, there's, there's some key questions we have to ask. The first is, what do we actually want to predict from this relationship? So we could predict volume fraction, you know, we could predict, you know, either mean curvature or the, or the Euler characteristic. And how do we make a decision about which quantity we want to predict? Now, what we're going to try to predict is Euler characteristic. And I'm going to give a reason why based on uh, geometric evolution. So if we consider geometric evolution in a bit more detail, it should be clear why we want to predict the Euler characteristic. So there's two basic ways uh, to describe how a structure evolves. The first is based on differential geometry, which is formulated at points on the surface of the object. So if you look at this arrow on the, the boundary of the blue region, we can identify two things. The first is the normal vector to the surface, and the second is the interface velocity. And that structure is gonna evolve based on how its boundary moves. So we can parameterize the changes in the uh, average variables um, based on this uh, differential geometry formulation. The second way is to use set theory. And in set theory, you're basically forming a set that would correspond to all of the points in the blue object. And then you predict geometric evolution by defining mappings between sets. So it's a little bit different because in a, in a set theory perspective, you're considering the, the, the global structure of the, of the object when you define a mapping. Whereas when you consider a differential geometry, you're really looking at local points and looking at how those evolve. And this can create challenges because there's some cases where you can't define the derivative in a differential geometry framework. So what kinds of uh, boundary displacements can we consider in, a, in the continuous case? So there's only some ways that the surface can evolve. And these waves are, waves are based on uh, surface harmonics. So if you look at the top structure, you basically have a, a continuous variation all the way around the, around the structure. It's a sort of periodic and, and connected all the way around. If you look at the bottom structure, you have something that's not a sphere, surface harmonic. It doesn't form a, a loop all the way around and you can't make a wave like that on a surface because doing so would rip the surface. So that's a non-physical solution. So the only solutions that you can consider are these, are these harmonics. And these harmonics are different depending on the topology of an object, meaning that the spherical harmonics won't align with the toroidal harmonics. If you have a torus, you'll get a different set of harmonics. So based on the differential geometry perspective, you can define a set of evolution equations that predict how the, the uh, structure of the object will, will change. So if we look at the time derivative of the volume, what you'll get is a source term that depends on the local interface speed, which must be a surface harmonic, according to the previous slide. The second piece, if you look at the, the change in the surface area with time, you get an additional contribution to the source term that depends on the local mean curvature. And likewise, when you go to the integral and mean curvature, you get a source term that depends on the local Gaussian curvature. Uh, so this means that you basically have to account for both these surface harmonics and 
the, uh, the curvature invariance, the boundary invariance of the structure if you want to uh, you know, predict how that structure will evolve. So these are integral equations. So you know, it, developing solutions or approximations to this kind of equation is challenging. If we now return to this parallel set thing, it's easy to get rid of that complexity if you just simplify it to consider parallel sets. So if we just consider a small change in volume, the change in volume is entirely predicted based on the, uh, the, the surface area. So if we define the rate of boundary displacement, we can simplify this so that we have the Minkowski-Steiner formula in a hierarchical form, which is basically to say that the changes to volume are predicted from the surface area. The changes from surface area are predicted from the integral of mean curvature, and the changes to mean curvature are predicted from the total curvature, or essentially from the topology of the object. So the reason you would want to predict topology with a state function is that in this hierarchy of equations, you need to know the topology to be able to get the other terms. So it's sort of this uh, driving source term that's at the top of a, a geometric evolution. So to go a little bit deeper into this, we can, we can just evaluate the Minkowski-Steiner formula for a couple of objects. So on the top, we has a, have a sphere, which has an Euler characteristic of one. And the bottom, we have a torus, which has an Euler characteristic of zero. So if we just use analytical expressions to compute the surface area and, and the mean curvature for these objects, then we can deduce what these coefficients would be. And we can see, based on this, that even though you have different topologies for the structures, the coefficients are one for the first two coefficients for both structures. Now suppose we consider a situation where we start with a torus and then we define a, a procedure such that it evolves into a sphere. So when this happens, you change the topology because when the hole closes into torus, it's gonna change the topology of the structure. And based on this, you get a discontinuity. So if you look at the bottom plot, the, the time derivative of the integral mean curvature is gonna have a, a discontinuity at time one because that topology changes. So you can see that that source term with the Euler characteristic propagates into the, the equation for the integral of mean curvature. The same thing is true for the, the time derivative of the area, but in this case, you get a second order uh, kink in the time derivative, like it's a, it, the second derivative that has a discontinuity in it, uh, which is less of a problem actually, but, um, but you can see that this hierarchical um, evolution is, uh, is sort of playing out in terms of this simple problem. <clears throat> in fluid mechanics, you see the same thing. So the most commonly studied topological change in fluid mechanics is the coalescence of fluid droplets. So when two fluid droplets coalesce, you get this point where the, uh, where the, the interface is first touched, where you get a discontinuity in the curvature which rapidly propagates into the pressure field. And then you get a bunch of uh, sort of rapid non-equilibrium effects as these droplets coalesce because as soon as they touch, they're pretty far from a near equilibrium state. So you can see how that little pressure shock uh, propagates and, and sort of uh, shocks through the system. So the associated fluid singularities are something that have uh, attracted a bit of attention already, and these are actually very common in porous media. So anytime you have loops forming in the pore space or fluid snapping off within the pore space, these are the events that change topology in a fluid system, you get these jumps in the Euler characteristics. So this shows what goes on in a single pore as flow occurs. And as loops are formed as you move forward in time, the Euler characteristic will jump. And then when the, uh, uh, you know, the, these jumps happen, you get an associated effect in the integral mean curvature. Now, uh, what you can do uh, with predicting topological changes, while you can't predict them with differential geometry, you can characterize the possible changes that exist. So there's only eight possible uh, transitions that occur which are associated with the, the Betty numbers. So one is this droplet coalescence, the other is loop formation. Uh, the third is the, um, the torus to, to sphere evolution that we considered earlier. And then the other, it would be uh, mechani you know, the, the mechanism that encloses a cavity or opens a cavity. 
So based on this, we sort of return to this non-dimensional theory and recast it in a form that will allow us to predict the Euler characteristic. So what we do for this is we basically say, we're gonna, we're gonna develop a function of the volume fraction and of Wi that allows us to predict Xi. Since Xi contains the Euler characteristic and the other terms don't. So if we, if we can construct this function F here, then we can use it to predict the Euler characteristic in terms of the other three geometric invariants. So in fact, you, you do get a pretty unique surface when you do this. So from the 10 different porous media, we had 239,203 different microstructures. And we analyze these, compute the, the geometric invariants, and then fit a, a hypersurface to it using a generalized additive model, which is just a statistically optimized spline. The error measures indicate that all but two and a half percent of the variance is predicted from the surface. And you can predict the Euler characteristic based on that function. So the comparison um, at the bottom shows what you get when you look at the Euler characteristic for a, you know, a measured poor scale displacement compared to what would be predicted based on the, the state function. So it works relatively well. You could probably predict when things will percolate and uh, get some sense for uh, what kind of history dependent effects you have in a material due to the geometry based on this. So um, in summary, uh, we've shown that geometric contributions to hysteresis and two fluid flow can be accounted for based on four invariant measures. Um, geometric state functions can be used to predict different things. You could use them to predict capillary pressure or volume fraction, but the argument that's made here is that predicting Euler characteristic is the best way to apply them just simply for the fact that it would otherwise be very difficult to get that information. We've shown that the non-dimensional non geometric state functions are valid for different types of porous media, for materials with different porosity, and for different flow regimes. So the data that was generated includes data from capillary dominated regime, from, from viscous dominated regimes, and from drainage and imbibition. So it's a wide range of different fluid states. And they're all predicted from the same function. So we just have one uh, function for all uh, 10 materials. So there's some key questions I think that remain. Um, one is to what extent does geometric characterization reduce uncertainty for permeability and the effective permeability? Um, Obviously, you know, it's sort of been established for a long time that the, the poor scale distribution of fluids influences how flow occurs within those materials. Um, so that's a key question. Uh, second is how general are the geometric relationships? In principle, uh, what you're doing when you construct a relationship like this is you're trying to build a, a, a function that characterizes the possible structures that can exist in 3D. So that's not restricted to two fluid flow. You could, in theory, predict any, any structure. And then third, I think strategies that uh, extend these kind of approaches to deal with material heterogeneity are particularly important due to the uh, amount of length scale heterogeneity that's uh, present in force materials. Uh, so I'd like to thank my collaborators and, and, and sponsors. And uh, again, thank the organizers of the conference. Um, I'll take any questions that uh, may be available. So thank you, uh, James, for this uh, very insightful uh, talk. Uh, we have uh, time for some questions. So if the audience wants to, to, to ask questions in the session Q&A, they are welcome to do so. Just by. I hope some, some people will raise questions, but I, I will ask some questions because it's, I mean, it's very interesting and it's changing a lot of the, the modeling uh, paradigm we, we have, especially with the multi-phase Darcy, because here you are using uh, more variables and you say that uh, they are not directly dependent with each other. Um, so wh what do you feel? So, what is so, the future of uh, the multi-phase Darcy's law, for example? So what the situation in this law? The situation is not that bad because essentially what we're saying, you know, the, if you look at the conventional models, they're saying that there's one degree of freedom and it's the volume fraction. What I've presented here indicates that there's really only two degrees of freedom, 
um, which is, you know, adding this additional non-dimensional measure due to the topology. And, uh, and if you can predict two measures, that's not really that much worse than one. You still, um, you know, you have to add additional information for closure, but it's not, it's not an intractable problem. What you would really need to do, I think, is you would need to add evolution equations for uh, the surface areas between the fluid and solid and the surface area between the two fluids. One of the consequences of the topological changes is that you can't predict either curvature invariant using a differential equation because anytime you, know, you go through a topological change, those derivatives aren't going to be defined because the left and right sides don't agree anymore. So you, your limit sort of disappears in that case. But um, what we've done suggests that you can get around that by using the fluid pressures to close the mean curvature and using the state function to predict the topology. So that just leaves you with surface area, which um, you know, other, other people have published evolution equations for surface area. So if you can figure out how the surface areas evolve, then you should be able to include all the geometric invariants in the model. The relative permeability question is another big one, though, because it, it's not just geometric structure. You also get momentum exchanges between fluids and, you know, other sorts of unsteady effects. So in that case, there's additional work that would needed to be to be done to figure out how to develop those or to val validate them. It's also, you know, since the permeability is a tensor, there's more geometric invariance if you consider it an anisotropic system. So there's some additional complexity uh, in dealing with that. But what we can do is we can separate out these sort of essentially geometric effects from other physical effects and try to really figure out how how much each physical piece contributes to the overall uncertainty in the constitutive models. Yeah. I guess it's not easy to, to, to separate a geometrical uh, feature from a physical aspect. I mean, especially in the case of capillary pressure, you see there is a very close link and it's not easy to say what is what. Well, there is, but you can measure them. So if you have, um, you know, we can measure, for example, in a simulation, we can measure the fluid pressures and we can measure the interface curvature. So we know what they are. So, um, you know, if you're doing poor scale work, the, the tools are out there to be able to just directly measure them. And I think if you were not directly measuring them, like if you weren't, you know, if you didn't have some poor, poor scale, you know, numerical methods to guide, you, you know, theory, it would be impossible to figure it out because you just don't know what approximations will work and what don't. Um, so, I mean, I think that there are some challenges there, but I do think that, um, you know, I do think it's like a solvable problem. The key, the key limitation though is, is availability of data. So, you know, with this, you know, state functions here, we had 240,000 points almost, and I don't have data like that for relative permeability. Like if, if somebody had, you know, 500 relative permeability curves, and they knew what the geometric structure with those was, you know, then they could really do something with that. But I, I don't have that data at this time. So I do have some questions from, from the audience. So it doesn't show up on my desktop, but it shows up on my, on my cell phone. So we have a question say, have you applied these methods and analysis to low density fibrous media? I haven't applied it to fibrous media. I would say that it, it should apply, but one thing that you, you know, again, this comes back to anisotropy and fibrous media, if the fibers are aligned, then you can have really strong anisotropy. And the measures that, that I'm dealing with here are scalar measures. So if you're dealing with uh, materials that have strong anisotropy, then there was, there's a paper by Gerd Schroeder Turk, I think, and some others that, that deals with the tensor Minkowski functionals, and that's the right place to start for that. And that is a little, quite a bit more complicated because there's almost 60 different measures there. But, um, but I think that that, you know, should work. Now, if you're just looking at capillary pressure, capillary pressure is a scalar, so you shouldn't need tensor invariance to pre predict the scalar. So we have another question and you, you already gave some, uh, some part of the answer here. So 
we have Zili who ask uh, in the last slide me you you mean valid in the last slide means that uh, capillary pressure and relative permeability are function as function of this uh, set of geometrical descriptors will be unique for different regimes. That's what you claim basically. Yes. So if you crank up the viscosity ratio and you get a viscous fingering regime, then you should still have a unique relationship because we, so the viscosity ratios, I think were a hundred in these simulations, the maximum, they vary between one and a hundred. And so you do get sort of, you know, clear viscous fingers within that regime and they're all on the same surface. So all the materials, they're all aggregated together. So it isn't like the Leverett J function where you consider a material specific function of saturation. What I'm suggesting is that you just measure all the geometry and throw it in one function. And it is really difficult to assess uniqueness when you have a surface, you know, in multiple dimensions. Um, and that's one reason why I think, you know, trying to find counterexamples or otherwise understand how these approaches, you know, may break down or the situations where they may break down is, is you know, potentially important. Um, and, and how you scale the measures can make a big difference on how good the fits are. So. Okay, so I thank you very much for all this, uh, this answer and for the audience to attend the, the presentation. So we will close the session and uh, we thanks again, uh, James, for this uh, presentation and we see you later. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.